This is Inspiring Careers with your host, Ingrid Centurion. We're gonna talk about fascinating technologies that will impact your future. Meet inspiring entrepreneurs and people that are making huge differences in the community and around the world. We're gonna share career and life lessons of inspiration and success. Our mission is to inspire our viewers to make a better life for themselves by sharing our stories, our interviews, and documentaries. Please. Stay tuned as we have incredible guests coming up. Hi, today I have Nancy Cancer with me and she's from Framingham. She started off her career as a teacher, then she went on to start her own jewelry business, then she went on to work for Landmark, an educational and training company. After that, she decided to start her own business. So we're gonna talk about her career, her life lessons, and she's gonna share what you can do to be just like Nancy. Thank you, Nancy, for being with us today. My pleasure, <laughs> absolutely. So I wanna talk about your whole career, how you started out here, you grew up in Framingham. I did. How, how was that? How was Framingham High School back in the day? Well, it used to be two high schools, so it was Framingham North and Framingham South. So I went to Framingham North, I mean, it was fine. It was, it was Framingham education. I had a good Framingham education. What was your class size? Um, I th as if I don't know, 440 people. Oh, okay. Somewhere in that realm. So yeah. that's a nice size. Yeah, it was a great size. Where, where did you guys hang out? Uh, Famous Pizza. For Framingham North, hung out at Famous Pizza. I think Sunshine Dairy was where the South kids hung out. And I'm not sure where the Marion kids hung out. And where do you live today? And the I South live in side, Ashland. And Ashland. Oh, I live, live in Ashland. Okay, so yes. you moved just to the next town over. I did. I so did a few things that. in between, but now I live in right. Ashland. Yes. But you have a lot of your business here as well. I do. In, in the Metro West Framingham area. You've been area. in this area, and we're going to talk about that. After you graduated from high school, you went to college. I did. Where'd you go? I went to UMass Amherst. Okay, so close by, not too far away from home. Not too far away you, from home. Your mom didn't want to let you go away? Well, I think my dad thought that would be a very reasonable school for someone like myself to go to. And tell us about the story, what you were doing in, uh, in college. Well, you were working on something. Well, it was interesting. I mean, when I first went to college, I really didn't have much of a clue what I was going to work on. So I did all the basics. And then it got a little challenging. And then somebody in my dorm was student teaching in the human development department. So I decided I wanted to do that. So they said, if you show up, they had a practicum that was starting. If you show up at 8 o'clock in the morning, you can do it. So I did. So I student taught. I became like the head teacher of a preschool. It was called the B.F. Skinner School at, at UMass Amherst. And I did that, loved it. Then I had to go back and take some of the courses that would have qualified me to do it. And uh, I didn't like that so much. And at that point, my sister was graduating from college and she was gonna go travel. So I took a year off and I traveled. And during that process of traveling, I really decided what I wanted to do was be a teacher. So I came back, I got my own apartment off campus. I paid for it myself whereas prior to that, my dad had paid for it. And I really created, you know, I really was very creative. I did special problems. I taught, I stayed there for the summer. I taught kids at the Living and Learning School. I did a project there. I did a lot of things. In, in college, when you decided, okay, I'm going to be a teacher, mm -hmm. what was your dream? Um, I wanted to help people. I wanted to make a difference. I mean, e even in my college years, I did a special project with one of the kids, well, two of the kids in my living and learning school were language delayed. And I was doing an articulation disorder, so I brought them to the audiology lab and I had them tested. And what they found out is one of the kids had blockages in his ears. He couldn't hear. And then from there, we got that cleared up. I created materials, I was doing art for the young child, so I developed all my own materials to work with these two boys, and I got them up to grade speed. So you were the behavioral management systems expert? You know, your education, you did a lot of stuff with children yes. that had special needs. Well, I think what I like to do is see problems and solve them. And I like to create environments where all kids can be successful. Tell us about the alternative high school model program that you developed. Okay, well, I was on a team, and this was in 1977. We got a federal grant, and it was through the Aspen Valley Collaborative. And so there are five of us, and we created a school from soup to nuts. We were at Quinsigamon College, because they wanted to have a place where 
kids could see other students going to school voluntarily. And we had kids from nine different towns. We created the whole curriculum. We created the whole system. Uh, you know, we really designed a school. And to this day, it's still in existence. Oh, that's great. And the kids that came to our school uh, graduated, and they got a degree from their sending high school. They're great kids. They just needed a little different kind of environment and structure in order to be successful. So after so many years in the education, when did you take that next step to start your jewelry design business? Well, I started getting interested in things that were more spiritual. I mean, not that teaching wasn't, it was, but you know, like yoga and meditation and things like that. And so I had the summers off and I went to, uh, well, the first thing I did is I was doing Kundalini yoga, so they have a Sikh summer solstice in New Mexico. So I went there, and while I was there, I bought some crystals and beads and stones and findings. I thought, oh, maybe I'll make some jewelry. And then after that, I went to Kripalu, which is a health and yoga center in Lenox, and I did their holistic practitioner course. So while I was there, you know, the first thing I ever made, I was in the dorm room, I was putting something together, and somebody walked in and they said, oh, do you do that professionally? And I said, yes. And I have no idea why I said that. So she commissioned me to do a necklace. And then other people saw how beautiful it looked on her. And then they wanted something. And then people that worked there would trade with me for massages and facials. So I created a whole little cottage industry there. So I thought, OK, I'm going to spend my next year. I'll teach, but I'll get my business together. But you know what that meant is I sold jewelry for a year. And that was kind of like your first step with the entrepreneurship. Definitely. Where you didn't, you didn't have any training, you didn't go to business school. So I what were not. some of the challenges that you faced that most small business owners who do the same thing say, oh yeah, I have a business, but they really don't. <laughs> well, I mean, he, here's the thing. I ended up selling to 15 stores. So I did have a business. Okay. What I did, and I had three girls that worked for me. What I didn't have was a set sort of the, and because I'm a business development coach now, I didn't realize about inventory. I didn't realize right. about net 120 or 90 or, you know, that you've got to invest all your money in the materials for a bigger order. And you might not get paid right away. Uh, to this day, I still have some of the inventory that I bought in the 80s. So those are some of the lessons learned that most people who get into a business or entrepreneurship, they don't know these things. Cash, so you learn the hard exactly. way. Exactly. Cash flow is king and how you spend your time and what you spend your money on. I had money saved up, so I'd come up with an idea and I'd spend money on it as opposed to be a lot more focused as what do you really need and you know how to, what's the appropriate way to drive your financial engine of your business. So after a few years of doing that, when did you take this job with Landmark and do the training in consulting? So I had been participating at Landmark. I had done a lot of their programs, and then I was volunteering there. I'd done a leadership training program with them, with them, and so I was volunteering. And it was right at this point where I was getting very stressed about my business. I had also moved out of a friend's house, I, you know, so my expenses were up, and I was feeling challenged. And so they offered me a job, and I said, okay. It just seemed to fit the bill. I love being there. I love the work that they did. So it just made sense, you know, when I could keep my jewelry business going, but I'd have a uh, salary and a paycheck. And you learned a lot from working at a big educational consultant company. Oh, absolutely. It was very, everything was driven. I mean, not everything. I mean, you know, it was sales, it was marketing, uh, statistics on it, but statistics on everything, which is definitely not the way I ran my business. <laughs> so I learned a lot about how to manage things, how to manage people how to have, you know, make promises about what you're going to do or not do. And Did you get to travel? Them. Um, you know, some, they would send me to training. I actually, they switched their curriculum, and so they have a four-part curriculum, which they still have, and one of the programs was self-expression leadership. So I went to California. I got trained for that. You know, certain trainings, I would go different places. I helped them open up Lenox, you know, for uh, having forums and, and part of their programming there. So some travel, not a ton. And after you spent those years learning and, and seeing a larger organization, what made you start your own coaching program and consulting business? Well, I think what happened is I got married and then I got pregnant. So these were two deciding factors in my life. And I was, you know, at the point before the I... The same year? 
Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> it, it, it was like a couple of years okay, later. Okay, so you got married. How long did it take you to have children? Uh, I got married in 1990, and my son was born in 1992. Oh, two years. It did not take uh -huh. long. So, I mean, I, you know, I didn't suffer or struggle right. with, you know, how am I going to get pregnant or any of that. I got, when I wanted to get pregnant, I got pregnant, which was really cool. Okay. And so, but I was being trained to be a center manager for Landmark Education, but once I got pregnant, that didn't look like it would be in the cards. So I worked there till I was eight months pregnant, and I kind of resurrected my jewelry business. Okay. So that worked pretty well for a while, but then I really liked the, the interaction of having a job, like going somewhere and being connected in that way. So I ended up going back to Landmark. I did a couple projects for them. I represented one of their courses, and that was wonderful, but after I filled the course, they would always lay me off. So after I did it the second time and they laid me off, I was talking to my friend in New York. He says, you should have a coaching or a consulting business. I said, well, what do consultants do? So he kind of gave me the model. It was kind of a coaching consulting model. And at that point, I was cleaning out my desk. Somebody wanted to talk to me. And she said, somebody recommended you as a coach. I'd like to hire you. I wow. Went, it was like, great. okay. <laughs> yeah. So she did. And then I reached out to other people I knew through Landmark because I had led programs. I had trained a lot of people, coached a lot of people. So my second month in my coaching practice, I had six clients. Wow, that's excellent. All by word of mouth, like everything. Word of mouth, word of request. Mouth, and, you know, my friend Mark lived in New York City, and he told me to charge a lot more than I absolutely would have. So that was a great way to get it started. And then you joined B&I. Well, I was living in frame? Arlington, and so when we we eventually got the opportunity to buy a house. We looked in Arlington. There wasn't much available in our price range, so we looked in other places. And my husband's uh, kids all lived in, in Ashland, so we went to Ashland. And the first house we saw, my good friend from high school, Judy Rizzoli, showed me a house. First house we saw was so much better and bigger than anything we had looked at in Arlington. We said, let's get it. So we did. So that moved me to Ashland. But then I had to figure out what I was going to do about my business. And Judy had also shared with me about BNI because a mutual friend of ours, Patty Salvucci, had started BNI, which is a networking organization. Right. So I called Judy right away and I said, I want to join BNI. I'm in. I got to grow my business. I do. Well, I need to meet people. Right. You know. Yeah. I, you know, it was around Halloween. I was walking down the street in Ashland with my son doing trick or treating, going, these people have no idea that. I'm a really good coach, <laughs> you know. So I wanted people to know me as I had been known in Arlington. Very good. Okay, well, we are going to go to break, and we'll be right back. <laughs> to Maddie, congrats on paying off all those student loans. Finally, right? How'd yeah. you manage that anyway? I started tracking my spending, changed a couple of habits. Wow. I'm kind of living paycheck to paycheck right now. <laughs> I don't even know how I'm doing it. Well, have you tried saving a little? <laughs> I want to, but where's that money going to come from? <laughs> Bill collectors, they're the worst. Am I right? When it comes to financial <laughs> stability, don't get left behind. Not home. Get tools and tips for saving at feedthepig.org. Let's talk about when you decided to focus your energies on women and have women businesses and women lunches and really focus on women empowerment. I think that's okay. a really part, a big part of you and you started this a long time ago. Well, it started I think around 1999 and I had just led a business group uh, for some of the women that I knew in BNI and one of the women, Donna Marino, who focused on marketing. She said the group was fantastic. I said, what do you think made the group fantastic? And she said it was all women. And I went, oh. So it was the first time I thought about really focusing on women. So she coached me. She said, you should have women in business luncheons. And I went, OK. And I had no idea why I should have women in business luncheons. But I followed her coaching. And I went to the Bella Costa, found like a side room that we could have it there. And that's how we started. And I've been doing women in business luncheons since 1999. So you are the, the what's the word? Guru of women's programming. The, gu the guru of women's program in the Metro West area. You started this a long time ago. A long time ago. And, and so this is really great. Tell us more about your entrepreneur source and how you incorporated that also into women. 
and the women's empowerment luncheons? Well, I mean, I think the entrepreneurial thing has been always ingrained in it. You know, so I was doing women in business luncheons, I was doing successful entrepreneur workshop, and I was doing designing for success. And these were all programs that I created myself. So I'd have people come to luncheons, some might, you know, do a workshop, then some might go into a group. And at one point, about 2003, I would have like two groups going, you know, usually with five to six women in them. And they were monthly groups, six month monthly groups with private coaching included in it. So, you know, I had my programming down. So then something happened. We are, and you know, I was helping. Um, I was helping the chamber start their women focus program. So I was leading women empowerment programs for the chamber, Metro, Metro West Chamber and Marlboro Chamber. Do you see the women topics and the women empowerment issues the same today as they were back then? How much of a of a change do you see as far as women entrepreneurs? Well. I think women are women, you know, and I think it's good that women are women and that I think what I focus on is to have women be themselves, not try to have a different version of themselves because they think they need to to be successful. You know, that women do well because they're relational and they're connected. And I'm not saying other people aren't because I think they're, everybody has masculine and feminine traits. So as a woman, you could have very masculine traits and so why not? use them you know uh, men can have feminine traits you know they really like to talk and connect but I would say you know in terms of building women's organizations community really works for women and support and places where you feel like you can really be yourself you know a lot of times when you're out there networking you always have to tell everybody how great you are at every moment at every time and sometimes it's nice to have a place where it's okay just to be yourself and ask for help or say hey does anybody else deal with this and then everybody goes, yes, you know, because I think for women it's really important to know, and I think for people in general, that you're not alone. The issues you deal whether you're a man in business or a woman in business, it's nice to know whatever you're dealing with, you're not the first person, it's not unique to you, and there are solutions and people can help. And so your community engagement really helped your business. Yes. Share with us the dream factory. So in how you started that. Okay, so in 2003, literally, I had a dream. And in the dream, I was answering the phone saying, the dream factory. I have no idea how I got that dream. I don't know why I was doing that. But I had just come back. I had done some studying on sacred contracts with Carolyn Mace in Findhorn, Scotland, which is a spiritual community. I just come back from Ecuador with nine other entrepreneurs who are working with entrepreneurs in Ecuador. And so both those places, it was very clear that community was the source of people succeeding at whatever they deemed was important to them. And so I decided that the Dream Factory would be a community. So I was leading a couple of business groups. They already had a following, women in business luncheons. So I just put it out there. I'm starting a community. I put a fairly minimal price on it. I said, please join. And people started joining. Awesome. So that was the beginning. and then. My business changed because I stopped doing the curriculum as I was doing it and I designed everything to fit the Dream Factory motif. So we had Chief Dream Officer training as a one day workshop. We started creating accountability circles that were run by members who were trained to lead those circles. And How the, long were your workshops? You said a one day workshop. It's a one day workshop, 10 to 4.30. And it's still that. Oh, okay, full you, day. It's a full day to get people you know, clear on their dream creation plan. And then they bring that plan to accountability circles where they're supported by a community every month. And you still run these workshops today? Yes. When's oh. your next workshop? September 14th from 10 to 4.30 and it's actually going to be in the Sudbury area. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. And you now have grown the Dream Factory into yes. different key locations. What locations are they around here? So we are in Concord. We're in Framingham. We have a virtual community and then we are opening up Sudbury. So oh, that's wonderful. why we're doing right. our CDO training mm -hmm. in Sudbury. And each one of those communities has events, some kind of events. So the women in business luncheons have become Dream Factory Lunch and Learns. So we still have those in the Framingham area. Concord has a breakfast. And then we'll see, you know, uh, Newton has ladies' nights out. And we're just starting with Sudbury, and we'll see what they want for their events. 
Awesome. I'm so excited. Yes. I want to join the Dream Factory in Sudbury. Okay, you're welcome <laughs> to. I would love to have you That's do right. that. I want to start that. You're right. It's all about community engagement and, and getting out and really getting others to know who you are and sharing what you do. And some people work and they never go to community events, right? They work out of state or they're always traveling. And no. having a sense of community is really important. It's really important. Our circles tend to be at night, but they, we have a couple that are during the day. Our events, you know, we're, tr we're playing around with when's the best time to have events, but we're open to what people need. Uh, you know, the woman that started our Concord community, she used to work for the Donahue Center, you know, U which is the leadership arm of UMass. And uh, she was with us for years while she was creating her business. Because, mm. you know, I just read a testimony she wrote, and it was awesome. She said, it kept my dream alive. And then when she decided, she, you know, when she started, okay, I'm going to start my business, she put on a workshop, and nobody came. Because nobody knew of her. And that's right. when she started the Concord community, so she would get known. And now she's got a full coaching practice. She's probably looking at retirement now. She's been with me for about 10 years. Wow, that's awesome. But we still have a thriving community right. in Concord, which is awesome. When is your next Dream Factory workshop in Framingham? Um, the CDO training. Okay, so the CDO training is going to be in Sudbury September uh, 14th. The next Lunch and Learn is September 13th. Okay. And we have them at Waterview Terrace Apartments right on Route 9 in Framingham. Okay, great. All right, since this is Framingham, and I want to definitely inform the Framingham viewers about this. Yes. They should follow their dreams, and this could be a workshop that really empowers them to go after it. Absolutely. And real support in actually, you know, clarifying what their dream is, but also making it real. And so all they have to do, dreamfactorycommunity.com, all our events are published on the first page. How has Framingham changed throughout the years? You've been here a really long time. Well, I think there's a lot more diversity in Framingham than when I went to school here. I, you know, my, I lived on Hemingway Road. It used to be a dirt road. Wow. And it was a big deal when Hodes came in, which was in the <laughs> Knobscot Plaza. I'm telling you, I can you, you know, the only... Uh, I was living here before the Native Mall was here, so all we had was Shoppers World, like this outdoor, kind of funny kind of mall that they had reindeers in the middle, you know, when it was Christmas time. It was really quite cool. We loved it, you know, but it's very built up, a lot more built up, a lot more diversity, which is awesome. There's one high school. There used to be two. There used to be kind of a rivalry, so there's none of that anymore, and uh, we have a mayor now. Wow, I know, and how about... The Dream Factory in other languages. You know, we have a lot of diversity in Framingham. Could, is, do, is there some future there as far as how many how many uh, Portuguese or Spanish-speaking coaches uh, are out there? Or maybe the potential of having a Dream Factory in another language? I think there's definitely potential of having that. You know, we had somebody in the Brockton area who uh, was interested in that, and then she became pregnant, as I became pregnant, you know, and then your priorities change. You know, we've had people in the community for long. We had a circle leader who was from Brazil, um, so that could have been potential. I think it's going to come down to, and this is, you know, because I don't want to, I don't want to try, you know, sometimes like my ideas are not necessarily where things are going to go. I like to pay attention to who my members are, what they truly want and need, and then from that, we can develop the programs. Uh, I'm more than willing to. I'm actually, because I've developed the CDO training, I have like the legal rights to do what I want with oh, okay. it, which is fantastic. And so I'm doing a program with Judy Giovangelo, who started Ben Speaks. And she speaks in high schools. And her program is all about empowering youth to be the change they want to see in the world. So she's going to use the CDO training, and we're adapting it. You know, so it's it's a little bit it, the cover look, the the workbook cover is much more suited to adolescents, and she's going to integrate some of the stuff that she does. It's very kinesthetic, so we're creating a program for adolescents. But that came from one of my members stepping up, going, "We really want to use the CDO training in this way. Do you want to play with us?" And I said, "Absolutely." That is great. So it's kind of like as I get older, it's more I I like it when people come to me and say we really want to do this and then we can play together and co-create and I think that's a great way to do business. 
Well, that's an incredible story. I really appreciate you coming on the show today, sharing your background, the, the challenges and the steps that you've taken to launch where your career is right now. And so the Dream Factory has a great future. It I does. expect more things out of the Dream Factory. And I'll be at your, your course and I'll be at your training and hopefully we can start working together on something. I don't know, I, but we'll come up Ingrid, with something. it would absolutely <laughs> be my pleasure. And one of, the, one of my projects is I'm creating a leadership academy for people who have taken the Dream Factory program and want to take it different places. Okay. So that is going to be great. developed this year. Okay. So we're going to have more Dream Factories, I can tell you that. All right. And they might have different flavors. Right. And they might be in different languages, but they're there and they're designed because I think people deserve to live their dreams. Mm -hmm. That's what they came here for. Mm -hmm. I know. Right? It's true. Yeah. I'm living my dream and, and I want to continue to live my dream. Absolutely. For many, many, many other years. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. you so much for being on the show today. So much for this opportunity. I really, really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you.